hand nailed to the cross of my chest as I stood reciting the words that would sign my soul over to a red, white, and blue hypocrisy. Thinking the dream ahead was something my ancestors bled and died for me. Not realizing that this American dream is actually a nightmare. Because as I look at my little brother, lying next to me, asleep on the cold floor, in a torn jacket, because there is no heat, it hits me. This American dream was not made for people who look like me. My American nightmare is filled with constant discrimination and not so subliminal messages that I would never be anything more than a statistic. That I'm a suspicious ruffian, armed and dangerous, and draped in a hoodie to hide my identity. That I'm uneducated, unmotivated, and barbaric. And that it would be better for you and everyone around me if you would lock me up and throw away the key. Prison to the simplistic ideologies of who I'm supposed to be and all the while I'm expected to remain silent. Well, I would no longer sit idly by as my life and destiny are dictated for me. I would no longer give in to being your statistic. Instead, I will create my own. I will be the first person in my family to graduate from college, leaving a path for my little brother to know that he can be more than what society claims. I will own my own business, and provide for my family and be the God-fearing individual this world never thought I could be. From this day forward, I will control my destiny. The time for me to stand was yesterday. The time for me to act will always be today. I will arm myself with integrity and shield myself with pride in who I am. And I will not stop fighting until I have proven to myself and everyone around me that I will be something great. I will cast out these nightmares and keep America dreaming until I claim and live my reality for me and my family. I'm done. Most wanted, gangster, thug, drug dealer, crack slinger, gang banger. They think I'm a killer. Not because I have a weapon in my hand. They see me this way as a young black man. Every night when I turn on the news, they flash in my picture and I'm wearing county blues. Old ladies crossing the street every time I walk by, they clutching their purses instead of saying hi. The message they sending is far from subliminal. Because the color of my skin, I made to feel like a criminal. Tell me, what have I done to deserve this plight? No matter how I look at it, it just doesn't seem right. Our ancestors was whipped and beaten down as slaves, wearing shackles and working till they went to their graves. Our families was broken, separated and sold, treated like property and left out in the cold. When slavery ended, we still wasn't free. We were denied jobs, the right to vote, and equal opportunity. We faced intimidation, threats, and constant attack. Separate water fountains in schools because we was black. Then God raised up Dr. King with a dream in his heart. He helped lead the movement to give us a new start. People gave up their lives so that we can be free and have a chance to fulfill our purpose and destiny. We cannot waste the time we have or believe lies we've been told. We have to fight. We have to press even till we get up. As a young black man, I'm proud to be me. I was made in God's image and born to be free. Born to be free, born to be free. Does anybody really understand me? I wonder about that sometimes. When I was younger, I started smoking marijuana because I was around other brothers and sisters who was doing it a lot. Around that time, 
my behavior started getting worse in school. I started getting in fights. And I went interacting good with my teachers. I ended up getting arrested and had charges pressed on me. And now they said it was time for me to see a judge. I ain't never been in no situation like this before. I was scared. The judge said he ain't want me around other people until I got psych testing done. He ain't want me in the community. So they had counselors talk to me about three, four, five, I believe, so I can remember. They was nice. They was respectful to me. But they asked me about a million questions. <laughs> and these tests, they were supposed to help me, right? These tests, they were supposed to help me, right? In the courtroom, the judge said they were sending me to a place called White Lucen, located in Wisconsin. Look, look, I was just looked and I had nothing else to do, turn my head and just, just start, saw my mama crying, like, I just knew I was crying. I ain't need no mirror. Cause we both knew she ain't had the transportation to come out there and visit me that far. She even asked. They still said they couldn't help her out with that. I was about 16 years old. I ain't never been this far away from home like this. The ride there it felt real long. Real long. All I saw was cornfields everywhere. <laughs> I just felt like I was in a maze, like. Everywhere I turn, I seen horses, cows. It's like, the more we drove, the more my stomach was hurting. And I was already missing home. And I have, have not been handcuffed yet. When I got to the treatment facility, they said they was going to help me. And I wanted to get help, because I wanted to get back home. I wanted help. Let's get started. I wanted help. So I start interacting with other kids there. And they told me their stories. And I found out. They there for deeper stuff than me. What I did, what? You did that? I felt like I ain't belong there. But even though that, I still said, I'm going to focus on myself and what I need help with. See, the problem was the staff, they did not know how to cope with me up here. They did not know how to cope with me. I remember one time I was taking a break and I had to go to the timeout room to calm myself down. And Staff told me to do something, but it was really minor. And I said, I don't feel like talking right now. Come back to me later, let me come. 
I was in a little seclusion room. And he just grabbed me and he choked me up. I was just trying to breathe. That's all I was just trying to live. He was choking me up. Just trying to live. Still choking me up. And I dropped to the ground when he was done. And I just held on to my stomach. I just breathing real hard like. <sighs> and I kind of didn't know where I was at. All I seen was four walls in the door. <laughs> then I just got up. And then I was scared. I I ain't know what to do. I was too far away from home. I just wanted my mama. I told everybody, the staff, what was going on, but they said everything was going to be okay. They was going to check into it, but I guess that was just to calm me down so they wouldn't get in trouble. About 28 days went by after that, I believe, and I was getting ready to leave. It's like two days left. I started telling everybody, all the kids that I was interacting with real well, I told them. But I watched how I told them because I didn't want them to feel like I was teasing them because I know I wasn't the only one that wanted my freedom. So I was just happy. And I decided two days before I was getting ready to leave, I felt like a lot of pressure was coming and I felt like I just needed some space to myself so I can think and be focused on my way to freedom. So I asked to go take a time out. I was scared still because I, I was shook because he choked me up. I thought I wasn't going to live. After that moment, but I said, well, maybe it won't happen again. So I asked to go back to the time I room. And I went in the seclusion room and I was sitting there and I was just rapping to myself. Just sitting down, rapping to myself, same room. Trying to think positive. Trying to throw what he did to me away and give him a second chance to understand that I'm a good person. That he can quote with me in a different way. I try to give him that chance. So that's why I asked to go back to the time I wrote. And I was sitting down rapping. Door was closed, just rapping. Two days before I was getting ready to leave. Just rapping to myself. Then I just heard the door open. And I thought it was something telling me, like, somebody called for me or something, my mom or something, want to talk to me or something. Then he just spread his palms out and just put his 
Something right over my head. He was gripping on my head. And he just grabbed it and shoved it all the way down to my chest. And said, shut the fuck up. And it hit the wall, my head. And I just was like a G, like, why you treating me like this? Supposed to be helping me. And it was a heavy set Caucasian man. And I'm just a child. But the thing that kept me kept me from really from really staying there longer was a while back I had a phone call with my mom and that's the only thing I heard for freedom was her voice. So it was repeating in my head while all that stuff was going on, while he was torturing me. And I was fighting with the enemy, resisting them, because God knew that I already had my freedom. I just had to be patient. Not only that, I saw other kids younger than me getting beat down on and slammed, younger than me. And I really, really, really wanted to help my other brothers and sisters. But, I would have got tortured again. So I had to fake like I didn't see anything that was going on. I did. But I had to fake like I didn't see anything. I done been through so many treatment facilities. This white loose is not the only one. But that's where I first started though. I've been through so much pain. Still is right now. I'm trying to tell my story. But the pain is the flashbacks, it hurts. I don't like thinking about it, but telling it is what has to happen though. It has to. See, what people don't understand is, is kids who's caught up in the system, in the treatment facilities, because someone says they not thinking too clear up here over a mistake they made. No one's perfect. See, what people don't understand is, it hurts us more than it helps us. It hurts us more than it helps us.
Just trying to tell it. Just, just bear with me. Just really hope that that place is a little bit better than what it was before I left because that man was, he, he's in my memory and it hurts. So, even though I felt like nobody wasn't paying attention, nobody, when I was looking at four walls and just a door, even though I felt like nobody wasn't paying attention, I couldn't see the sky or the sun, but I knew God was paying attention though. I knew he was paying attention though. I knew he was. He was there for me. And he always been there for me and still is right now, right here. That's why I feel like it's my part to tell my story and wake the world so they can be there for the kids that's really, really needing help. The ones that need help. I feel like it's my part to lead the way for them children. And I know it's kids right now that's going through torture, but I know someday change gonna come. That's why I am the messenger. As I look in the air, I see faces of people that was once there. Memories of things that was never done, taken away by the cold, heartless gun. Never will we see their smiles traded for a gangster's lifestyle. Never will we hear their laughs, their lives has been cut in half. All the bad choices they make, all the hearts they break. All the people they affect and all the lives they wreck did just for a little respect. The streets labeled them as thugs, but I'd never break a mother's love, who would do anything to trade places with her son, who was taken away by the cold, heartless gun. If you can control the man's thinking, you don't have to worry about his action. If you can determine what a man thinks, you don't have to worry about what he'll do. If you can make a man believe that he is inferior, you don't have to compel him to seek an inferior status. He will do so without being told. And if you can make a man believe that he is just an outcast, you don't have to order him to the back door. He will go to the back door on his own. And if there is no back door, the very nature of the man will demand this building part of the equipment. I refuse to let someone tell me that I can't be great. I am a businessman. When I was 13, I joined a gang. Where I grew up, there were lots of gangs. 
And even though no one in my family was in a gang, most of my friends were. Being in a gang was glorified in my community. Everyone was in it. And the ladies loved the gang thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know I love the ladies. <laughs> back to what I was saying. So even if I tried to fight the urge to join a gang, I felt more into it. People get into the fights in my community it's like an everyday thing. And yeah, I had friends. And we were cool. But if something was to happen to me, they weren't always down. But if I was to join the gang, then I'd get more protection. So I joined. Just like a team, our gang had a uniform. The uniform was Air Force Ones, Jordans, Jabo jeans, tall tee, and a do-rag. And wearing this, wearing this made me feel inferior. It made me feel this way because I would see someone who was, you know, dressed nice or dressed professionally. And that made me feel like that made them better than me. I felt this way because they had nice things. They seemed happy. And you could tell that they had a good paying job. Whereas I, I was selling weed for money, you know. I always wanted to be a legit businessman. In my heart, I always have been a businessman. You know, I felt ashamed for being in a gang because no one in my family was in a gang. And if they found out that I was in one, they would have been very disappointed in me. So I kept this a secret from my family, even to this day. That's that back of the bus mentality, man. The back of the bus mentality, that's something that I made up. And let me break down the back of the bus mentality for y'all. Back of the bus mentality is sort of that mentality where you feel inferior. As a result, you hold yourself to a lower standard because you don't realize you deserve better. Instead of following your dreams, you settle for less. I felt inferior. So I made decisions in my life as if all I was going to be in life was a thug or a gangbanger. And again, all I ever wanted to be in life was a legit businessman. You know, looking back, I didn't tell my friends about my dreams because they probably would have told me things to make it seem like my dreams was unattainable or something. So I started to feel like a part of me maturing was to be my own man was to be my own person. Because man, there was people in the same gang as me. They were fighting between each other. I felt like there was no unity. And when I first got into the gang, it was for protection. But when I came up here, I didn't have any. I was on my own. So I started to feel dumb, fighting over a word. Just a word that's used to disrespect the gang that I was in. I also started to feel dumb, fighting over a color just the color that represented that gang. I just felt like there's more to life than just all of that. And if I'm gonna fight for something, it's gonna be something that was against me personally. So I got out of that lifestyle because it wasn't for me. When I die, I wanna be remembered as a successful black man who was a great example for people around him and for younger generations. And like I said, best believe I am a legit businessman. Excuse me. I got to take this. It's business. Through all of life's struggles and hustles, I will be victorious. My name is Christian Devantendrick Bonner, and I have a story to tell, but I don't want to show my face. I am like nobody you have ever met. You'll go home tonight with my story etched in your brain. I'm unforgettable. I'm different, and I'm going to make it, and I deserve it. So listen. I was born in Hammond, Louisiana, 1993. I also lived in the ATL, A-Town, Atlanta, my home. My mom, Nayuki, my dad, Jazz. 
My pops was a hustler. He did anything he had to do to take care of his family. He did what he had to do. My mother's family members, they were drug dealers in the same town we lived in. They took good care of everybody in the family. My dad, my mom, both came from big families. Lots of hardships, emotionally and physically. My mom started making bad decisions, but to her, that was what she had to do to provide for me and my little sister. And it cost her. It cost her freedom. When she was incarcerated, me and my little sister moved up to Minnesota. I had a lot of anger and hatred in my heart. It took it out on a lot of people. Most of all, myself. I came to St. Paul in 2007. My mother got arrested in Georgia, sentenced to prison all the way down to Florida. Stealing identities, drugs, drug game, money fast, money quick. She was hustling. I knew there was a lot going on when I was younger, so I had to go up quick. I had houses, cars. I had every gaming system a kid could want. PSPs, PS3s, shoes, everything. When my mom went to prison, when she left, October 15th, we came up here. <laughs> it was a different feel. New school, new people, I loved it. Even the air felt different. <laughs> it was colder up here. I had never seen snow before. My sister and I were excited. We loved it. Until everything changed. It became the coldest winter ever. My uncle got killed. It was December, a week before Christmas. Frost just set in. He had a fight over in St. Paul, some bar. Dude shot him in the heart. That was it. He was gone. I didn't know how to react, so I started acting up. Started getting depressed. Started wearing only black. I was always in, I was always aware of my mental illness affecting me, but throughout my life, but the whispers of depression, it turned into loud screams. I tried committing suicide by jumping off a bridge. I couldn't do it. I walked around the city of St. Paul all night. I couldn't do it. I was cold, upset. I cried. I went to the mental hospital. They kept taking me there. They kept putting me on medicine. I knew I had ADHD before, but medicine they put me on it made me sleep. I was more depressed than ever. I started feeling suicidal again. I slept everywhere. I'd wake up on a Saturday, I'd be tired. I felt like my body was moving in slow motion. I gained a lot of weight. I complained it didn't feel right. It, it didn't feel like me. They didn't care. Eventually, they took me out of River East and took me to school over East. I got good grades, A's and B's. My teachers liked me. I was proud of myself. Things were finally good. Then my mom came home from prison that summer. When she got back, everything changed. I got into it with a cop over at Rondo. I got suspended. My mom got mad at me. <laughs> that put me in a bad mood. So I went over to my auntie's house, and this dude tried to punk me. He took off on my bike. I took off right after him. I jumped him, beat him up. I went back to my house, got a baseball bat. I chased him up the hill into the house. He ran a security guard. It didn't matter, because I was breaking the window. Bam, 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 breaking glass, breaking the window, breaking the glass. I ran back down the hill. My mom came up to get me. She grabbed me. She stomped me on my chest. My mom started choking me out. They sat me down in the chair, and I was bawling. I threw up. 
Then the police pulled up. It was my first time getting charged, juvenile. They took me to JDC, downtown St. Paul. I sat in the cell for hours and hours. Went to court the next week on a Tuesday. I got off, gave me a PO, came back home and things still weren't right. I went back to look for the dude, this time with a knife. Police came looking for me and five cop cars pulled up. Took me back to the hospital. I started freaking out, throwing chairs at security guards, whatever. They secluded me and put me to sleep. I don't remember much after that, but I remember I got another charge, another one. And the only thing I could think of was how angry I was at my mom and my dad, still. I stayed locked up for a year and six months. They stayed slamming me on the ground, bleeding. No one cared. I stayed on suicide watch and I sat naked in my cell as they sat and watched me. It made me so damn mad. When I tried to sleep, pow! They'd hit the cell, wake me up. Everything was loud, actually. No keys, just orders over a loudspeaker. Doors boom, gates clash. I used to hate it. After I got out, the slamming commenced. The marks on my hands and my wrist, you can still see them. The handcuffed imprints from getting slammed. I was shackled. They didn't care. I couldn't do nothing. Modern day slavery. When I got out, I was worse. It was November 12th, my 16th birthday. I started acting out again, gang banging, fighting. I was furious all the time. But the thing is, when I went to White Lucen, I had a real breakdown. Everything in my life came to a head. I was just so upset. They had on me on all these medicines. I was tired of getting poked by needles. Then they put me on the scariest medicine of all. <laughs> and I started seeing things. I stayed up for days, four or five days. By the time I stayed up for six days straight, I lost it. Broke down. I went crazy. I went down to the cruising room. I felt paranoid. I had a panic attack. My heart was beating fast. The staff was out of the room, so I climbed up to the ceiling and tied, tied a wire around my neck. I wasn't even thinking. It all happened so fast. And I jumped down. I was hanging myself. I wanted to die. I hung myself. I really did. I was scared. And I realized I didn't want to die. I tried to climb back up and I'll hang myself. I couldn't. The wire was so thin, I started strangling. The staff couldn't get, take me down. It took three minutes for them to get me down. And when they did, I couldn't even breathe. <gasps> and they took me to the mental hospital. I was fighting. I was fighting. I was fighting because I was upset. I'd been on eight different medicines. I was 16 years old. They changed it all the time. It messed me up so badly. It was already bad enough being bipolar, but this was killing me. I was tired of trying, tired of the foster, tired of my dad tricking on my mom in and out of my life. My mom complained about everything. My auntie in jail, my cousins always in Louisiana gangbanging on some straight dope boy hustle stuff. It was hard. Nobody knows what it's like. One minute you have everything. And the next, you don't got nothing. The time in the system helped me, I can't lie. I got back on track. I could have been in a 10 by 10 cell with no books, no money. It made me reflect on my life. It helped me control my anger, how to slow down, how to think things through, how to expand my mind. And now I realized I'm not just smart, I'm brilliant. My potential is limitless. I'm on my hustle, a legal one. Five years from now, I'm gonna be with my own family, 
my own house, back in the South, Georgia, my own land, good job, successful. Nothing average in my future. Now when you've walked the walk that I have, I've been to hell and back time and time again when most men would have just given up, but I'm not most men. I'm Christian. Remember my story. Remember my name. Because like I told you, I will be victorious. I like to consider myself as a catalytic converter. Now some of y'all may be thinking, what is that? Well, a catalytic converter is a reaction chamber typically confined in a finely divided platinum rhythm catalyst into which exhaust gases from an automotive engine are passed together with excess air so that carbon dioxide and hydrocarbon pollutants are oxidized into carbon dioxide and water. <laughs> all right, all right. A couple are uh, looking a little lost. Let me break it down for you. See, I can make something out of nothing. When a train is derailed, I get it back on track and I keep it moving. Basically, I get things done. Ben Franklin once said, when you're finished changing, you're finished. Now, I don't know about y'all, but uh, finished? Yeah, that don't sit right with me. I'm all about action. Several years ago, I got mixed up with some of the wrong people and ended up doing seven months in jail. During that time, a lot about me changed. Before I went in, I wanted my life to be just like the brothers I saw on the streets and on TV, the ones with status, you know? Respect and um, money. More or less, man, I was all about getting money. I had a one-track mind. I thought I knew it all, and I thought I was untouchable. All that changed when I got locked up. As you might expect, I was dreading having to serve my sentence. But as I look back, the lessons I learned and the experience I gained, had a value I couldn't even begin to measure yet. I grew up in a neighborhood where drugs, violence, and hardships were popular. I was five when my family moved up from Chicago to Minneapolis. All my role models was drug dealers. I idolized them for the materialistic things they had. It's funny though, it was kind of like hypocrite role models. They'd tell me one thing that I shouldn't do that was bad and turn around and do the exact same thing. They used to always show me guns and other weapons and even let me hold them and use them for practice. There were shootings, drive-bys, and killings going on in my, my neighborhood. But sadly, I became accustomed to these tragic conditions. When I was 12, I owned my own guns and other weapons. By the time I was 13, I wanted the same thing these drug dealers had. So I became one. But I kept away from the house for fear of my mom. My mom, she knew about the things that was going on in the neighborhood, but she tried her best to keep us away from it. She used to always tell me things like, boy, you need to graduate. I was so afraid of the consequences if my mom found out about my actions. When I was 14, my mom moved us out the neighborhood we was in out to St. Paul. My activities with the drugs calmed down due to the fact that I didn't know anybody from St. Paul. About a year later, I started mingling, and I found my way back into selling drugs. It's one day I'll never forget. I came home from school. I knew my mom was going to make me do some cleaning, so I hurried up past her room, ran straight to mine, grabbed my gun, and ran out the back door. As I was leaving out, my nephew was coming in the back door. He said he had a blunt, asked that I had some weed. I told him, yeah, tossed him a sack, he rolled it up. As we was walking through the alley, the blunt is being rolled and sparked, and by the time we got out the alley, it was on me. As soon as I grabbed the blunt, a police car rolled past, so I threw it. Spent a couple of minutes looking for the blunt, and I said, forget it. We can spark up another one when we get back. It's gonna make some stains. We made a few sales along the way, but then we came across a group of like 15 to 20 guys. A few of them looked familiar, so we went over. One of them asked that I had some weed. I told him, yeah. Pulled out a couple sacks. Then the guy came from behind him and grabbed the sacks out of my hand and tried to run, but he dropped two of the three, and that pissed me off. 
me and my nephew started arguing with the guys over the drugs, but mostly because I felt disrespected. A couple seconds later, I looked over and my nephew was beating up on one of the guys. And they all started jumping my nephew. So I pulled out my gun and I shot one of them. They all started running, so it wasn't no point for me to keep wasting bullets. I helped my nephew up off the ground. And when I looked up, a black truck was coming at me fast, so I pointed my gun at it. But before I could shoot, it put on its police sirens, so I ran. I threw the gun under a dumpster and kept running. I fell, got back up, and kept running. I got tired, so I hid behind a trash can. Like five minutes after that, a police dog was on me, biting me like crazy. I ain't gonna lie. I was screaming like a little girl at the Justin Bieber concert. <laughs> they picked me up, searched me, asked me, did I have any sharp objects they should know about? I told him, I don't know what's your job, find out. <laughs> he said, shut up before you put the dogs back on you. I started talking real tough to the officer. In my head, my lips weren't moving no more. They put me in a squad car and started asking me questions about what happened and where the gun went to. I told them, look, I don't know. I only ran because y'all, they were shooting and y'all was behind me in that black truck chasing me. They eventually found the gun, and by that time, I was laying in the back seat because the dog bites was hurting like crazy. They took me down to the holding cell, took my fingerprints, lifted the powder off my hands, and took my clothes and had me sitting in the cell naked. About an hour after that, a guy came in and took pictures of the dog bites. Like 15 minutes after that, they came in with a hospital gown and walked me through the hospital lobby. And that's the first time in the whole situation I felt embarrassed. I learned a lot from that situation. But now that I look back, I've learned what I can do. It's been said, a person can either be a producer or a parasite to society. Although I had my shares of tribulations along my journey, I still have a lot to give. As a matter of fact, because of what I've been through, I want to serve as a positive role model to the young people that's coming up in our community. I know it's hard to listen to somebody who doesn't know life on your side of town or hasn't been through what you've been through. Since I have, I want to be there to relate. I want to work with young people to hit our troubles, hit our struggles, and help funnel all that to get individuals back on track. Like Gandhi said, you got to be that change you want to see in the world. And I'm trying to be that change now. Thank you. Dear son, your life hasn't even begun, and you're already public enemy number one. And by the age of eight, you'll be an enemy of the state. And by the tender age of 13, you'll be portrayed as a little thug who's cruel and mean. And by the time you're 25, you'll be projected to not be alive, a victim of black-on-black -black homicide just another alleged gangster that died. But who are they to tell you and me your destiny? The day I gave birth to you won't be a mistake, or the ground will swell and the earth will break from the enormity of love I have for you. Seven pounds, 11 ounces, your sweet cocoa brown skin, your round puffy cheeks, your father's nose, your mother's lips, and I can't even speak about the majesty and the glory that will be in your first smile. The first time you roll over and when you stand up for a while, the first time you say mama and the first time you lose a tooth. But as you grow and grow, I won't be able to hide my baby boy from the truth. Son, the truth is they'll think you're stupid they'll be surprised that we spend hours at home working on your reading instead of watching reality TV. And they'll be perplexed when the little brown boy knows how to spell the toughest word in the spelling bee. And when you give a speech, they'll be shocked 
that you don't trip on your words and properly place your verbs. They'll send letters home to your mama saying, Malachi is surprisingly eloquent. Did he write that himself? Are you sure he didn't copy it? He didn't have any help? And I'll write back damn straight. My son's been writing sonnets since the age of eight. If you need him to teach you how, I'm sure that'd be great. <laughs> Because some of them would rather see you strapped with Berettas and bullets than carrying classical Chinese philosophy. Because you're supposed to be en route to prison. At least there's their, that's their plan. But there's no bars that can lock on the spirit of an educated black man. They're more afraid of your ambition, more deterred by your dreams, more suffocated by your success because it can't be ripped at the seams. You're supposed to be stupid, ignorant, the antithesis of bright, but your brilliance will astound them and you'll blind them with your light. Son, the truth is they'll think you're a criminal. And every time you walk into a store, hungry pairs of eyes will follow you, searching for more. So keep your hands in your pockets, keep your fingers to yourself, if you aren't sure you're going to buy that, then leave it on the shelf. Because they'd love to arrest and detain you, try and arraign you, lock you up, throw away the key, abuse, and maim you. But it's not their fault. They'll say, we've had incidents of thefts for a while. He's innocent, our bad, he fit the profile. Honey, due diligence isn't always owed to you. You have to understand that to some people, Always, you'll be nothing more than just three-fifths of a man. Like when you're driving down the, hall, the, down the highway in your all-black bins, leaving a graduation party at midnight with your friends, when the red and blues turn on and the cherry tops pull you over. And you remember, your dad warned you this would happen when you got older. Hands above head, spread your legs, don't look them in the eyes. Tell the truth about everything. It's not time to dabble in lies. Even though your humanity feels broken as you're shackled on the ground and cars full of hungry eyes drive by, judgment all around, though your dignity may feel damned and your hurt has nowhere to hide, son, hold fast to your potential. Hold fast to your pride. Son, the truth is they'll think you aren't worth a damn. They'll see you as a blight on society, just another big black man in jeans and a hoodie, a potential killer, a probable dope boy, a possible crook, a waste of space, a basic bum, not worth another look. I can't explain why they project these images onto you. At seven pounds, 11 ounces, you were my son and you are my sun, my moon, my stars, my night sky, my heart. And as much as I'd love to lie and tell you it'll be all right, this society will tear you apart because they need you to be a vicious savage. But you never even were from the start. The system doesn't work if the black man isn't the media's toy. But you aren't a stereotype or a gimmick. You're my baby boy. And this ploy to make you a monster, to shake you of your spirit, and gut check you for your glory isn't OK anymore. To rip your hood at the seams, to hang you high, and lynch you because of your audacity to dream, until the desperate cries of my only son fade away into a silent scream, <laughs> isn't OK anymore. And I will speak the gospel on how little boys like you have targets on their backs since the age of two. But we turn a blind eye because we don't want to see that our little boys are shackled and singing unchained melodies. But I will protect you to the ends of this earth to ensure that my son is free. You will be nothing that they claim you are. You'll be the opposite of what they expect you to be. You'll be a motivated man with a mission. 
You'll be a success story for all to see. You will change this world and make it beautiful. You are the difference and you will manifest your own destiny. Thank you. I am the poet. I am the messenger. I am the businessman. I will be victorious. I am that change. And, and we, we will not, not be, be forgotten. forgotten. They don't know whether to bow or to run, so. <laughs> so they tell us to, to let you all know that they're not actors. And one of our young men, I, I said, you're a thespian. He's like, a what? He was so, after that, we just said, okay, you're just telling your story. It's all to the good. But <laughs> Go ahead. I just want to say as, um, a young African-American woman, to see you all in a totally different um, capacity, sharing your story is so, so even more inspiring um, for the work that I hope to do. So thank you all so very much for being willing to share. And you all did a great job. We have time for one more. There's one. Um, I just wanted to say that, make sure that y'all don't minimize what y'all just did today, because I think there's a lot of young men and young girls that they'll see a light in you and that'll be enough for them to do what you're doing, because it's, it's easier said than done. Amen.